you know, phototherapy really dates back to ancient times when Egyptians used to expose their skin when they had different skin conditions to the sun and noticed that in approximately 200 BC, by exposing their skin to sun, that the sun's ultraviolet rays would result in an improvement in their skin rashes and other conditions. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome to episode number 46 of the Healthy Skin Show. In this episode, we're going to discuss how you can use light therapy as part of your protocol to address chronic skin rash issues. This type of light therapy is done in dermatologist's office, though there are more devices that you can find that are entering the consumer market that are available online. But today we're going to discuss this, whether it is a helpful thing to do and what to avoid with a really well-known doctor who's done a lot of research in this area. But first, let's take a question from a listener. I've heard you mention many times about the importance of pooping, but I'm wondering if you can give any additional information to someone who drinks a lot of water, who runs and walks numerous times a week, and who takes fiber supplements daily. What else can I do to be eliminating one to three times per day? Thank you for submitting this question, Allison. It's a good one. And I know that oftentimes I'm answering questions about skin issues, but for those of you who finally come to realize that there is a very important connection between your gut and your skin, pooping optimally, meaning that you are pooping one to three times a day and that your bowel movements are easy, solid, and formed, that you're not taking a long time to strain, nor are you ending up with really loose bowel movements either. So that is our target, and I'm glad that you know it. You've heard me say this. You're like, hey, I'm doing everything right. I'm doing the movement piece. I'm doing the water. I'm doing the fiber. Why can't I get to that ideal spot? Well, one thing that you can try is magnesium citrate. It's actually very helpful for keeping the bowels moving correctly because it's not the most absorbable form of magnesium. I would recommend you start at around a half of a teaspoon a day. Um, Typically, I like to get the effervescent forms that are available on the market. There's a product called Natural Calm that's available at Whole Foods and a lot of other grocery stores and online, even on Amazon, that's really easy to buy. You just want to make sure that whatever you get doesn't have a whole litany of other ingredients to it. So you don't want other supplements like calcium, especially not calcium in it, just magnesium citrate. You add a half of a teaspoon to some water and you drink that down. I'll usually suggest that people do that like before bed, but you could do it earlier in the day if you want. If after a few days you don't notice a change, increase by another half teaspoon and you'll keep doing this. Wait a few days, see how you do, and then increase again by a half of a teaspoon in order to give yourself time to adjust to that particular dosage. What I would say is you probably don't want to go above four teaspoons per day. So that's somewhere around 600 to 700 milligrams per day. I would also suggest that you not take any more than, say, like 350 milligrams at one given time. So you could do two teaspoons before bed and then another two teaspoons. If you get up to this max dose, you could do that sometime earlier in the day, maybe late morning. This is the thing with magnesium citrate. If you take too much of it, it will cause diarrhea. That's not what I want to happen. You don't want that, though it might feel good in the moment, but it's really not good for your microbiome. That's why I typically suggest that people start with a half of a teaspoon and work their way up. Beyond that, I would say like 600 to 700 milligram range in a day, you really need to get help from a practitioner. And ultimately, magnesium is probably not the only problem that you have. The other piece to this is that you should get your thyroid checked. One hallmark symptom of Hashimoto's or low thyroid function is constipation. So it's important to get a full thyroid panel run as thyroid also plays a role in the health of our skin. And last but not least, I would highly recommend that you look at what the heck is going on inside of your gut. And that means doing basically a gut check. So we're taking the stool and we're looking for gut infections, what the balance of the microbiome is like, 
Is there a state of dysbiosis? Do we have too much yeast present? Maybe there are organisms that really shouldn't be there. Or you have gut flora that are more opportunistic and are in too high of quantities and thus out of balance to actually help your gut really keep things moving along. So doing some sort of functional stool test can be incredibly helpful because they look for everything, not where you go to your doctor and they have to write a script and tell you exactly what infections that you're going to get checked for because that's all the lab will look for. And instead, a functional stool test gives you the capacity to really lift the hood up and get some answers as to what the heck is going on. Now, if you do find something that is not food fixable, I don't care what you read online, whether it's an anti-candida diet, which I've talked about recently, or some other type of diet, you can't use food to fix infections. And oftentimes you can't use food to fix dysbiosis. You really need to step it up. And in those specific cases, we utilize antimicrobial and sometimes antifungal herbs in order to address what's there, because the idea is that we need to remove what's excessive or what shouldn't be present. We need to repair the gut, so reseal it back up, and then re-inoculate the gut with healthy gut flora that can act as essentially bouncers in this gut club that you want to have really good, happy balance present. But those bugs are there to help keep opportunistic bugs like Candida or E. coli in check. That's why a lot of times we address at a lower level the lifestyle and food issues first because they're the easy things to check off the list. But when we really can't figure out what's slowing transit time down within the bowels, then we have to start looking deeper. And so as I said, magnesium citrate can be a really great tool. You have to get your thyroid checked if you have not done so yet. And it's more so than the TSH. You're looking at a full thyroid panel And then also doing functional stool testing as well to be able to get a sense of what's going on and living in the microbiome. For those of you who have been dealing with more constipative issues, these would be the initial points of entry to start diving deeper. If you need help, feel free, reach out, get in touch. But if you've got any other really good questions about your gut and anything else in regards to the gut-skin connection, head on over to HealthySkinShow.com and leave us a voicemail. Ask all about what's going on, and I'm happy to include your question in an upcoming episode. All right, I think it's time to dive into our conversation today all on using light therapy in your protocol to help rebuild healthier skin. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I've got a really interesting guest. Um, He is a dermatologist that has a lot of experience in the whole world of sensitive skincare. And I wanted to talk so much about this topic of UV light treatments and how that can be incorporated in. And, you know, if there's any concerns, because people have had questions about concerns in in using that in their, their journey. Um, And so I thought, why not bring someone on who has experience with that, who can speak very straightforward to you about the pros and cons of that. Um, My guest today is Dr. Jared Dagdeo, and he is a board-certified dermatologist in New York City, specializing in helping patients achieve their best skin. He's an expert on sensitive skin care concerns and nail aesthetics. As a physician scientist who sees patients and conducts skin-related laboratory and clinical trials research, Dr. Jagdeo is the founding director of the Laser Aesthetics and Body Institute and the Center for Photomedicine, which are both located at the SUNY Downtown Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jared. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. Well, I'm excited to bring this information forward because I think a lot of people don't oftentimes get full, complete answers from their doctors. They just kind of get these, well, I think we should do this and that's it. And they really don't know whether they feel comfortable doing that or not. So can you talk to us a little bit about what is UV light therapy and why it might be helpful for somebody who's had chronic rashes that they can't seem to get rid of or manage just with like topical steroids? That's a very great question, Jennifer. A lot of patients who have chronic rashes that they can't manage just with steroids UV phototherapy may be a great option for them. 
The reason why UV phototherapy may be a great option is, is that there are different types of UV phototherapy, either delivered by fluorescent bulbs in what looks like an upright tanning booth sort of setup, or via laser. And this can be done to help patients via suppression of their immune inflammatory response to whatever their skin condition is. And this helps create a much less red, less irritated skin to help patients achieve a lot more improvement in their skin condition and their symptoms. Some of the conditions that are treated that are, have inflammation as a key component of the condition includes vitiligo, eczema, and psoriasis. Those are three different types of inflammatory conditions that are very common in the population. And by using UV light, you're able to actually reduce the number of inflammatory cells that are in the skin that cause these conditions and result in better, younger, healthier skin. One of the wonderful things about UV phototherapy is, is that it's been studied and refined over the years. This you know, fo sort of phototherapy really dates back to ancient times when Egyptians used to um, expose their skin when they had different skin conditions to the sun and noticed that, you know, in approximately 200 BC, which is, you know, over 2000 years ago, that by exposing their skin to sun, that the sun's ultraviolet rays would result in an improvement in their skin rashes and other conditions, such as symptoms such as itching and burning and just irritation. That's really interesting. So what about somebody who has these conditions and they're afraid to go out in the sun? I, I mean, I'm not saying that they're co necessarily comparable, but right. do you ever recommend that patients, say somebody has really bad um, eczema or something like that, would you, do you ask them like, hey, how much time do you spend out in the sun? <laughs> you know what? You know, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because as a dermatologist, I oftentimes share with patients that they may want to limit their sun exposure um, and definitely choose how to get that sun exposure because we're always worried about the concerns of the UV light and other forms of light that are part of solar radiation causing skin cancer and aging. And so, you know, the sun puts out several different types of radiation. UV radiation or UV light is about 10% of the light that gets put out from the sun. And then visible light, such as, you know, the whole spectrum, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, <laughs> green, blue, indigo, violet, that comprises about 45% of the light that comes from the sun. And then infrared light actually comprises the other 45% of sun emissions. So, you know, one of the things that's really kind of taken off recently and, you know, I'm very fortunate that our laboratory is a pioneer and at the forefront of this is studying the benefits of other sorts of light, such as visible light and infrared light for skin health and wellness. And one of the things that we've really found is, is that, that you can actually change skin cell function and also um, different skin conditions by using visible and infrared light to enhance skin health and wellness and also some and limit some of the harmful known side effects that are associated with ultraviolet radiation. So choosing the specific wavelength of light may have a tremendous amount of benefit and tremendous potential for skin health and wellness. That's really cool. So you're actually, it's like you're kind of able to cherry pick what part of the spectrum may work best for a condition as opposed to saying, hey, go out in the sun, be exposed to everything. And you, it's kind of like a mixed bag <laughs> where you don't know what you're going to end up with. Um, so we use this light therapy. It's helping to reduce this immuno-inflammatory response. Does it also affect the microbiome of the skin at all? So there haven't been a lot of studies with regards to how light changes the microbiome. The microbiome is such a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Basically, the microbiome is the interplay of different um, 
organisms that are on and in our body and how those affect health and well-being, including skin health and well-being. And this is such a fascinating topic because so many different things actually do uh, change the permutations of our microbiome. And the microbiome has been found to actually lead to improvements in skin health and wellness, especially one of the things that's been really well studied and uh, investigated over the years is how the skin microbiome is involved in different skin conditions such as acne and also atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as eczema. So it's really important to have this microbiome studied as we are, have been doing and continue to study how light actually changes the microbiome. That is such an important topic, yet more research dollars and time need to be spent yes. on. I agree with you. I have a question too. Um, you mentioned the different spectrum or the, the spectrum and there's these different types of light. Have you heard of something called red light therapy? I, I've started to see some products on the market and I've seen some people say, oh, well, I'm using the red light therapy to help with my skin. And I'm always a little bit skeptical. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of wondering, do you know anything about that? Is that sort of like a fad or is there maybe something to it? Well, I am so happy that you asked me about that because that's actually one of my areas of, of scientific interest. I've studied um, in the laboratory and, and in clinical trials, red light phototherapy for, for more than the past decade. Wow. And this is such an important area of research. And th red light actually has the potential to really improve patient health and wellness. I'll share with you that we've been looking into it for um, improvement in hair growth. We've also looked at it in terms of how red light can help even out the uh, skin's tone and texture by minimization of scarring and normalization of the main cells in the dermis known as the fibroblasts. Wow. Absolutely. So, so is it something though where, and, and so you and I both know there's a lot of people that like to kind of do things on their own, but we also know that there can be a big difference between what happens and goes on in a doctor's office, for example, or a, a medical center versus what you can buy on the internet. Right. So my question then is for everybody going, oh my gosh, maybe I should go buy a red light therapy unit that I can find online. Do you know if there's any difference between what might be available at say like your practice right. um, or at your center versus something that you can buy commercially online? I think that that's a really important aspect that you bring up, you know, what patients are able to do at home versus what they can do in the physician's office. What I like to tell patients is, is that it's so important to use products that have been backed by science and backed by clinical studies that really support their use. A lot of these red light products are not comparable. It's very important to know that because mm. patient, we're only able to see the light output. But, those, but the red light is just visible as a red light output. But there are so many different things that are kind of unable for us to see, such as the power density, the, way, the specific wavelengths of the light. And it's really important to look at some of those other parameters in terms of studying their clinical benefit for patients. So that's why I do like to recommend that patients use products that have only been clinically tested and published on or presented on at meetings that have shown benefit. Because otherwise, as you said, there are a lot of differences in, in some of these products. And, you know, a red light is not just any old red light. You have to have a clinical grade product. Right. And what you get on Amazon, <laughs> I don't know right. how much they cost, but, you know, it might, something you buy for like 25 or even $100 might not be comparable and you're like, I'm doing all this red light therapy. And in reality, you're not really using the appropriate type of device. You are absolutely correct. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Some people have also asked me about tanning beds. And I know you mentioned in the beginning, you said, this, this, it's like a stand-up booth that kind of looks like a tanning bed. And I thought, you know what? I really should probably ask about this because I, I have heard horror stories that some people thought that they could go to tanning salons and use that because their skin would improve after getting in a tanning bed. But you and I both are very well aware that there is some really serious risks involved with the tanning bed. So what's the difference between going to a tanning bed at a, you know, some salon around your sure. local area versus the type of UV light treatment that they would get through 
a dermatologist office. That is an excellent point that tanning beds that are in tanning salons are very, very different and distinct and harmful compared to the phototherapy units that are in a physician's office, such as a board certified dermatologist's office or an academic medical center. I would like to just share with you some of the key differences. Some of the differences involve um, design of the phototherapy unit and also some of the safety associated with it. With regards to most dermatologists' offices, the lights that we use in our systems are actually narrow band ultraviolet B light. And this light does not penetrate very deeply into the skin. And it's really very fine tuned to give the best benefit in terms of anti inflammatory, yet yield the least amount of side effects to patients. Oftentimes, the tanning beds that are in these tanning salons are ultraviolet A light, which may not be the right sort of therapy for depending on what your skin condition is. Ultraviolet A light really leads to more immediate tanning. So people come out immediately tan and brown, which, you know, that may sound attractive to patients. However, that often does a lot more damage to the skin. We dermatologists sometimes do use specific wavelengths of ultraviolet light, A light, called UVA1. And that's oftentimes for much more um, deeper in the skin problems, such as a scleroderma, which is like a scarring and hardening of the skin, which is not really anything similar to atopic dermatitis, which is also known as eczema or psoriasis. So for psoriasis and eczema, you really want to ha go to a dermatologist, a board-certified dermatologist, be evaluated fully, and consider using a phototherapy unit that gives out narrowband ultraviolet light. And that wavelength is usually around 311 to 313 nanometers of wavelength. So the point here, the, the message... <laughs> The, the tanning off. bed is not the way to go. It's not safe, and that's not really how you're going to get the most benefit for your skin if you've been dealing with these issues. And I know that we didn't, we weren't really focused on scarring, but I do get questions on scarring. And right. so UV light therapy can actually be beneficial. Like, say somebody has scars from eczema or psoriasis or acne, like acne when they were younger, you can also use that as so, part of your treatment? So I wouldn't, UV phototherapy would not be my modality for treating acne scars or scars from any other condition. I would really recommend that, again, a patient goes and sees a board certified dermatologist because we are the experts in treatment of scars, especially the ones who specialize in, in using laser treatment modalities. Ah. A fractionated carbon dioxide laser or CO2 laser is really the accepted gold standard for treatment of, of scarring, and that can really lead to great results. There are other modalities that are on the market that can also give great outcomes for patients who have scarring, such as microneedling with or without radio frequency and some non ablative treatments as well. There are some other injectable approaches for the treatment of scarring as well, such as an anti-inflammatory Kenalog or steroid shot that can sometimes give benefit as well. Hmm, interesting. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that we kind of cleared that up, but that's great that there are also those options too, because a lot of times you can end up with scars that are pretty unsightly and people can still feel like they're walking around, even though the, the issue may have resolved itself, they're kind of still walking around almost like marked or branded from this, this long period of time where their skin was really unhappy. So one last question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Because I think this is a question, like it would be a question that I would have if I was a patient considering this. Is there a risk of cancer with this more narrow band UV light or is that something that you have kind of controlled for because you're being more careful in the type of light that you're using in this type of treatment? So very fortunately, the risk, the theoretical risk of cancer is very, very small using narrow band, either phototherapy or uh, an eczema laser, which is a 308 nanometer wavelength laser, which is specific for um, UVB light for these inflammatory conditions such as vitiligo, atopic dermatitis, or psoriasis. Really, I haven't seen any patients who have ever developed 
any skin cancers due to this type of phototherapy. And that's really the wonder of being able to fine tune these lights to be able to give patients mm-hmm. the best outcomes possible. Wow, that's really, that's actually really great to know that because, you know, I think sometimes people are nervous to ask those questions, but it's important to ask questions and to be, to walk into something like this fully, like you, you've got, you've got the full deck in front of you and you're like, all right, I, I feel comfortable with this. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for answering these questions and being so candid about them too, because a lot of times there's confusion about how to best take care of your skin. And I know that my listeners are really motivated to be their best advocates. They've struggled and suffered for a long time. And I know that they're really going to appreciate this. And so we can, fi- how can we find you? How can say you're located in Brooklyn? You have, sure. do you work in clinical practice? Absolutely. I'm here at the State University of New York, SUNY Downstate Medical Center. And I'm the director of the Laser Aesthetic and Body Institute here. I'm able to see patients for any skin condition that they would like. And I'm also available via Instagram at Dr. Jared Jagdeo. So please reach out, come in, and I look forward to seeing you. Yeah, and we'll definitely put all of your links of how everyone can find you in the show notes. And I know that you also have a publication as well. We'll include that too, because it's nice to be able, I know that some of the listeners are practitioners. They're very interested in getting their hands on more information. So it'll be nice to be able to share that with them. Thank Thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. I hope this has been really valuable because I get concerned when I see in message boards that people are actually going to tanning booths and using that as an alternative to getting the type of light therapy that's used for medicinal purposes. And I look forward to spending more time digging into this topic in future episodes as well. If you have any questions, please head on over to the post For this episode, leave your questions for Dr. DeJango. And of course, we're going to have the links there, everything that we've talked about in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, make sure to share this podcast with someone you know who may be going through something tough with their skin. Feel free, share it on Facebook groups, share it in forums. And remember that you sharing this might be an opportunity for someone who is desperately seeking support and help and another way being stuck with steroid creams and medication that they don't feel comfortable taking. All right. Thank you guys so much. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.